far. So it's an absolute pleasure to be talking to you. My name's Nathan. I'm talking directly from Italy. And uh, I have the absolute pleasure now to introduce a, a new theme, safe engagement in the online classroom. So um, this is a, a really, really important subject um, that's going to be dealt with by um, my colleague, uh, Barbara Lewin. And it's going to be talking about the online, offline situation, specifically the dangers, the safeguards, and so forth. Now, just to tell you a little bit, put you in the picture with regard to Barbara. Um, Barbara is a safeguarding trainer and consultant uh, with many years of experience of working within the LT sector. She's worked both as a teacher in a range of roles um, within schools, including safeguarding and welfare. Uh, Barbara delivers in-house training and advice in, in uh, language schools and colleges across the UK. And in 2016, she also founded the Sussex Safeguarding Forum to share information. And she consults with relevant local government authorities and delivers bespoke training within the region. So we're really eager to, to hear from you, uh, Barbara, if you want to come online now. Um, if you want to bring up your uh, screen. And are we here to help, Barbara, if you need any help uh, with any issues? Can you hear us, Barbara? I can hear you. Okay, um, great. It's great to have you with us. You. Absolutely great to have you with us. So um, we are very eager to, to hear what you've got to say. And uh, if you need any extra support, I'm here with you. Um, and welcome to everybody uh, who's listening. So let's go. Thank you, Barbara. evening depending on where you are um, a very warm welcome uh, to this session that I'm about to do for you on safe engagement um, in the online classroom um, as Nathan said I've worked in language schools as an English teacher um, both here in the UK um, and abroad and I've also worked in various other roles within centres um, student services and and welfare um, before I became a full-time safeguarding trainer. Um, <clears throat> in today's session, I'm just going to move this slide on. I, I noticed Christopher had a bit of a delay and I think I might have a little bit of a delay, so bear with me. Um, in today's session, uh, we're going to cover four main areas uh, with the aim, hopefully, that by the end of this session, um, you will feel more confident and feel ready to keep your students safe whilst you're delivering uh, teaching online. The session is going to look at what you can do as teachers um, to ensure that your classroom environment is one where safety for your students works alongside your students learning whilst ensuring that your lessons remain engaging um, and effective. We're going to look at the why, the how and the what that we can do um, ourselves to ensure that um, safe, we're safeguarding both ourselves and our students. If you have any questions while I'm um, going through the presentation, please put them in the Q&A and I will hopefully be able to answer some of them at the end of the session. So do, do far away as we go through the session um, uh, this morning or this afternoon or this evening, as I say, depending on where you are. Um, I'd like to start uh, by asking you to complete a small poll. So, um, Nathan, if we could put the poll up, that would be great. Um, this is just to get a feel of how everybody is feeling around um, this issue of safe engagement. Um, so if you could pop the poll up for the moment and we'll have a look at that and um, see how that's going. So if you can uh, have a look at the poll section and put in your responses that would be great barbara i'm sorry i forgot to say we're not going to put the poll on the screen because it causes issues so if you click if you oh. click on, on the poll tab um you can see the poll taking place there you might need to click on open within the poll tab and see the poll that's taking the poll that's perfect okay. yes i can thank you very much so i'm seeing quite a lot of agrees majority partly agreeing coming up um and a few i don't agree so yeah if you can keep going with that just for we'll see how we go the vast majority seem to be around the the um partly agree at the moment
as I say, a few, a few in the don't agree area. Do 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 a, do respond to the poll. If you can't see it, it, uh, it should just be on your screen under polls. It's please have do it because it's very useful to to see how people feel in the room, in the virtual room, if you like. So um, do press away. I'll give you about another thirty seconds, if if I may. OK, so I can see that the majority of people seem to partly agree with this. What I hope is by the end of the session, you'll all feel a little bit more um, towards the ticking that you agree. And, and fantastic that there are those already that um, feel quite comfortable and confident around um, the safeguarding area. So um, why do we need to um, safeguard our students um, when we're online? I'm just going to go back to try and moving that on I again I'm not sure if I there we go uh, why do we need to keep our students safe so different countries will think of safe in different ways um, in the UK we refer to safeguarding but it may well be that you have a different terminology um, in your uh, country wherever you're based um, and for many, the focus of safeguarding is around children, but of course we're safeguarding our adult students too. In the UK, just to say that uh, for safeguarding purposes, uh, the age of a child is anyone under the age of 18, but again, that may differ depending on where you're based. What we are tasked with really is to ensure that all of our um, children, when we're talking about, as I say, in the UK are the under 18s, um, are growing up and learning in circumstances that it is consistent with the provision of safe and effective care and that we take action uh, to enable all children to have the best possible outcomes and we want this as i say for all of our students both children and adults because we want all of our students to feel protected so that they can feel safe in the learning environment um, and, and where they're learning and most importantly of, of course we all have a responsibility to ensure this. The thing I would like to say is don't always think of safeguarding as those headline news items, the serious incidences that we sometimes hear about. Um, safeguarding is also general welfare. It's the day-to-day -day care of our students that we're working with. We need to help our students learn what's appropriate when they're online, how to protect them from harming each other, for example, um, with bullying, but or rather stopping bullying, um, but as well as working to support children and, and prevent um, child on child abuse, um, abusive behaviours. The truth is that there are also those out there who want to gain access to young people in particular to carry out illegal or inappropriate abusive behaviours. Um, forms of abuse, um, such as sexual abuse or criminal exploitation for their own gain. Our adults, as well as our, our younger students, also need to learn how to keep themselves safe, as we all do, um, and learn how to protect themselves because they may well be vulnerable to exploitation from a financial or, or criminal activity. When we are Le uh, teaching, I am sure this is the aim that we all have. We want our students to be able to focus on the lessons and be in a place where they are safe to learn and engage with, uh, with us and with other students. This is absolutely the case for all of our students. Safeguarding is important whether we are teaching online or offline. The principles remain exactly the same. The best interest of the student must always be maintained. If we have a concern, we should act on it, report it immediately. We shouldn't let unsuitable people gain access to young people. And we should always protect our students whenever they are online in the same way as that we do when they're face to face. 
Now, the reality is that we now experience and live in a world where people move seamlessly between the online world and the offline world. Our online world and offline world has merged. This, I think, is particularly true of young people. However, the online world offers and invites riskier behaviours um, because of this misunderstood protective barrier, I think, of not being face to face. A lot of online interaction is faceless. The possibilities of being someone else, of presenting as something else, um, promising unattainable things, removing consequences, all of this means that there's a this is a place where we have to help our students understand the risks. So what are some of those risks? Well, I've already mentioned um, bullying is one potential risk, but there's also access to harmful content, um, potentially grooming online or radicalization. Now, as teachers, you are in an ideal position to help your students navigate this online world so that they are safe during the lesson and that they understand how to keep themselves safe beyond your lesson. So in the wider context um, of the lesson that you're, you're delivering. Now, I was watching Chris's um, very interesting talk just earlier, and I was interested to see that he was referring to the four C's um, in relation um, to the, the discussions around climate. Interestingly, with online safety, we also have four C's um, that we use in terms of the dangers around being online. Now, the first C is conduct. So this, as I mentioned, is around the way people behave online. It's that riskier behaviour, the um, bullying or sharing of inappropriate images, giving away too much personal inf information. Um, sometimes that pressure to fit in might lead young people to take part in harmful online challenges. Then you have content. Now, content is particularly important when uh, we are delivering online because this is around access to materials that may end up being inappropriate, but it also is around illegal um, or age uh, inappropriate materials or materials that may include things that are violent or discriminatory or perhaps misinformation, um, unreliable content. With contact, this is referring to contact with unsuitable people. Now, this could be, um, thinking about grooming situations, adults trying to access young people, perhaps posing as a child themselves, a young person themselves. But it could also be young people pretending to be someone else or seeking access to someone to harm them or, or do harm in some way. And finally, um, there's commerce or contract. And this is around more of a financial harm that can happen online. So um, blackmailing, frauds, financial scams or frauds or, or phishing, um, or online gambling when it's illegal. Um, you know, if you're not of an age where gambling um, is, is allowed or indeed is allowed at all, um, then that's one of the issues. Our grooms are, um, sorry, our students are, are groomed and at risk in many, many ways. And if we look at one particular risk, for example, about online grooming um, that leads to sexual abuse, um, there's a very interesting report that came out last year from um, We Protect Global Alliance. And they reported on the grooming that goes on online and um, the statistics are staggering. They talked about the fact that there were 3 million accounts registered to 10 sites on the dark web. And if you look at just the states, the amount of reports that are um, being made every day is, is quite um, frightening, um, really. Um, and don't think this is just limited to one particular country. This is happening around the world. So it's something that we need to be very, very aware of. And as I say, it's not just grooming, 
um, for, for adult abuse onto young people, there are other potential risks as well um, around uh, online and what we need to consider when we're working online. Peer on peer or child on child um, abuse. This can take many forms, as I've already mentioned, bullying, but it can also be um, relationship abuse, um, harassment um, for sexual purposes, sort of sharing of images um, that are inappropriate. Digital isolation can increase. If we are delivering online, already our young people or our students are spending time online. Um, uh, we've spent a lot more time online in the last couple of years with COVID and lockdowns. But what happens is, is that young people then um, aren't encouraged to, to go away from the screen and spend more and more time online and not in, re in interacting um, in face-to-face -face situations. Financial exploitation can also happen. And I, I know that primarily this is aimed at adults, but younger students um, are also at risk, sometimes seemingly willingly, um, and don't think they don't. We had a case quite recently in the UK where a, a teenage boy was uh, convicted of um, a cyber crime where they were um, very cleverly um, uh, duping people out of money and then using that money to to uh, buy other things. So um, the point is, is that young people have a lot of technical knowledge and they may not feel the victim. So we still need to make sure we're putting things in place to safeguard them. As well as all of this, we're also becoming much more aware about the impact of safeguard of online and being online and the impact on our mental health and mental well-being and the mental well-being of our, our students and particularly our young students. They're dealing with a lot of complexities in their life already. And the additional pressures from being online um, adds to these pressures. It's complex relationships, setting boundaries, pressure to do well, um, family events, national events, world events can all have an impact. So what is important for us is to make sure that we learn how to notice. The importance of picking up jigsaw pieces. I always talk about jigsaw pieces in safeguarding. It's the clues. Young people don't often come out with something straight away. They drop hints through behavioral changes, language that seems out of character, absences from lessons, we need to pick up these jigsaw pieces and report them. Then hopefully the person monitoring those reports will get a much better picture of what's going on for that student. Remember, what may seem like a small thing in your class, if that's being repeated in other classes or in other activities that your centre is running with those students, it could be an indication of something bigger or more serious going on. Don't doubt your instincts. If it doesn't feel right, if it's not within that student's norm, report it. So with all that sort of understanding um, of the background behind why we need to safeguard, how does this impact on our lessons? How can we deliver our lessons without feeling that we have to modify what we do? The answer is in the detail and not surprisingly, the planning. From starting the lesson, the use of your technology through to the materials that you're choosing to use. These are all important. What I want to make clear, though, is safeguarding doesn't mean blocking creative aspects of your lesson. What it means is thinking about <clears throat> thinking about what you want to do and thinking around them to check for potential causes of concern or potential risks. If you're new to delivering lessons online, think about your face to face lessons and then revamp them for the online environment. Interactive technology is brilliant. I know sometimes we have problems with them, but on the whole, they're brilliant and they can play a really important part 
um, in how we deliver. And it can be very exciting to, to deliver in this way. And you want to feel you can use it to its full advantage. It's just important, as I say, that you always have safeguarding considerations in your mind when putting together your plan. Think about what you're asking your students to do and think about how you're asking them to do it. Now, you may be delivering your lessons as synchronous lessons. So this means that you're there, you're present, you're noticing and observing, and you can see those jigsaw pieces in real time. You'll also have more control over the environment that the students are working within. When your lessons are asynchronous, so then the students are working on their own. Here, you're relying on your students to follow your instructions. Think about those instructions. For example, if you're asking your students to do some research, have you checked what kind of websites might show up in that search? Are they age and or material appropriate? If you're asking your students to watch an excerpt or a clip from a, a video, have you checked the whole video to make sure that there's nothing else in it that may be unsuitable for, for that person, that those students of that age to be watching? It's also important to think about how you start and end the lesson to make sure uh, that the environment that you're, you're setting up is safe, is a safe space. Never have a lesson that um, hasn't been organised by your centre or your school. Don't organise those lessons directly, unless, of course, you're working as an independent teacher when you have no choice. If you have the ability with the technology that you're using to have waiting rooms, use them so that people don't come into the students don't come into the room until you are ready. Use passwords. Make sure that video, videos are switched on at all times. It's important to know who's in your classroom. If someone isn't expected, don't let them in. And certainly don't let them stay. Ask your centre, if possible, to provide you with registers um, and uh, ideally photo ID. It's really um, important because we've experienced situations without videos or where videos have been switched off where students have stopped watching and someone has taken their place. There have been examples where a student has switched off their video and then the video has come back on and someone completely different has been there. And in some circumstances, it's been in a room of young people and suddenly an adult has been watching and has had access to all the people and all the young students in the room. So, like I say, having the video on um, is very, very important. I'd also get your students to use their real names. Now, as I've mentioned, we have this seamless world between online and offline. And a lot of people have online personas and use nicknames and online names. But you insist on real names in your classroom. It helps to reinforce that this is a formal setting. Um, so always use real names where you can. Don't leave your students on their own in the room, either at the beginning or the end, because this is where things like bullying might take place. And it's also very important to establish the ground rules um, for your students. So let them know who can speak and how do they keep themselves muted or unmuted um, how do they unmute themselves? And most importantly, how do they ask for help um, if they need it? Getting to know your students helps you understand those jigsaw pieces. And of course, we can do this in a, a variety of ways, um, including icebreakers when we first meet our students. However, a word of warning. An icebreaker was set up by a teacher and two students were put together uh, for this particular activity and were asked to get to know each other as part of this activity, but were given no guidance, no boundaries and no rules. They were just told, find out as much personal information as possible. 
So one student asked the other, tell me, what's your family name? Oh, and how do you spell that? Do you have any brothers or sisters? Oh, and what are their names? Do you have any pets? What's its name? Oh, well, that's unusual. How do you spell that? And then they asked, when's your birthday? And, well, not just the date and the month, but what year? Now in the chat box, what do you think that student used that information for? What did it provide the student with? I'll just give you a couple of seconds. Just put a one word answer into the chat box. With all that personal information. I'm seeing bank account, password, hacking into social media, bullying, identity theft, hacking. Yeah, all of those. And that's exactly what it was. Um, it was trying to get hold of the student's information for their password, because again, as much as we are told have different passwords for different things and make them complicated by using upper cases and, and symbols and numbers and letters. The reality is, is not only do we keep our passwords simple, but we also um, uh, keep them the same for all of our accounts. This student went on to blackmail the other student saying that they would upload posts onto their social media if they didn't give them money. Now, I know this is an extreme case, but we do need to think about our lessons and what we're activities and what we're asking our students to do and give them guidance and rules and, and boundaries um, so that they don't um, give away too much in, in information and that we don't inadvertently help them to give away too much information. I'm not saying discussions and free conversations are a bad thing. They are a great thing. They're an opportunity for you um, to, to use these, these times to check, to check in with, uh, with your students, um, to help your students develop. Also to give you noticing opportunities for those jigsaw pieces and to provide positive reinforcement um, for, your, for your students. So just think about how you are setting things up. Also think about the other features that may be available from the technology that, 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 that you're using um, when you're delivering your lessons and how these factor in with safe engagement. So for example, the chat feature. Now the chat box is often seen as a way for students to communicate um, and is sometimes used as an integral part really of lessons. But again, stop and think about how it might also be misused. Who's monitoring it? Can you monitor it? Is it possibly an opportunity for students to be making inappropriate comments or sharing too much personal information um, or even bullying? Does the chat need to be switched on at all? So think about how you use it and when you use it. Um, maybe just you for a finite period of time when you are able to monitor what's going on. With your materials, I want you to be as creative as you possibly can be and use a variety of materials because that's what engages students and that's what helps us achieve the aims of our lessons. But again, just to reiterate, make sure that when you're planning those lessons, you check the suitability of the materials, particularly online resources what else might be included? So for example, if the lesson plan calls for students to undertake a internet research, um, sorry, an internet search, you do a dry run. Make sure that the content that comes up will be appropriate. Think about things like the pop-ups that might occur around that search. Algorithms are smart. So, um, you know, they look for certain things. So, so 
do the dry run first. And if you want to use a specific page from the internet, take a screenshot before the lesson. If you capture that screen, if that content, this ensures that you know exactly what might be around it. So if there's any adverts or public comments, you know that this won't have changed since you last checked it. It's much safer to have it in advance prepared. And if the students are instructed to access materials, think about the instructions you give to make sure they find the right websites and don't inadvertently go to something quite different. Of course, check its age inappropriate, uh, check, check it's not age inappropriate, check its age appropriate. Always check, check, check that. And if you're sharing your screen, be confident that there is nothing inappropriate on any of your other tabs. Don't give away any other information, so only have the one tab open. Now, I know that um, images from lessons um, are sometimes taken. Teachers like to do that, to use in other lessons. And honestly, our marketing teams love images from lessons. But again, think about the appropriateness of the image before you take it and before it's shared anywhere. Is there an alternative? Do you have to share the students' faces? Could you take an image of their work? Could you get the students to do an audio and share that? Why are you even taking this image um, in the first place? As I said, if it's, if it's to use, um, you know, make sure that there is purpose. Be aware that when we take images and use them, we might be giving out locations of our students without even realizing it. Abusers are looking for clues and ways to access, and they may be uh, able to see you know, the students, what their interests might be, what they were involved in, and it gives them ideas for, for grooming processes. And of course, get consent. If a student doesn't like the image, um, do you know what you can do? Can you get take it down? But always ask if it's OK um, to take an image of a, of a class online. Do you know also what's expected of you? Now, I know it might seem like a strange thing to think about because, of course, we're all professionals. But have you been given guidance on what's expected of you when you're delivering online? Um, do you understand everything um, around that? And if, if not, then ask. Um, if you don't have one in your centre, consider recommending that you do have one, because it's not just about protecting yourself, but it also helps you know that all your colleagues are working to the same standards. It's also important that there isn't a blurring of professional boundaries as we deliver lessons online. There is a potential for students to feel their relationship with the teacher is more personal because they're at home, not in a classroom themselves. So whilst they may want to engage about things that are happening in their personal life, remember, um, even if you are delivering from home, that you avoid discussions around um, your personal life and your home. So having a student's code of conduct is vital. Now here are some examples of some positive things that you could put into a student code of conduct um, and included in that I've put in about giving them a name of someone that they can contact if they have any worries or concerns um, while they're um, in the lessons and they're learning. But as well as the positives don't forget we also want to be clear about what they shouldn't be doing. So have something in there about what you won't find um, acceptable and, and what is not okay. And again, um, make sure that that's very clear to all the students, but not just the students, tell the parents. So if you're working with young people, make sure the parents are aware of the code of conduct, make sure they've acknowledged it and they understand it and that um, it's very clear. If you find yourself in a situation where you have to remove a child from a class because of their behaviour, I guarantee the first thing the parents are going to do is to contact you or the centre to say that's why has that happened. Now, if you've got 
very clear code of conduct that the parents have had before the lessons begin, that helps you. And the open door policy is very important because that open communication between parents and, and the centre is vital. But again, make sure it's done through official channels, the school email, the school phone, um, phone, not your own personal one. Now, I said at the beginning of, of this presentation that it's also important for us to help our students uh, stay safe in the lesson, but it's also important for us to help our students stay safe beyond the lesson. Our modelling um, through the, our lessons is one way of doing this, but we can also create lessons uh, such as conversation lessons where we embed online safety messages. Remember that the internet has no borders. Um, you can use what you've heard to inform your teaching. And it's important to remind our students um, about how to keep safe. You know, things like online posts are permanent, stranger danger, think before you post. Um, social media is not real life. Uh, respect when you are online, respect others. Open up that conversation. Make your students the experts. They know an awful lot. So child to child, peer to peer learning empowers and encourages collaboration. Find ways to engage your students regularly um, in the messaging and, and, and talk about the benefits and the risks of the online world and give them the space and time to ask questions and talk about any worries that they may have. Here's an example of a, a type of lesson that you might do. It's a, something that um, um, uh, I have had seen um, from the British Council and um, it's a very useful way to do it yourself. In fact, let me give you a moment just to have a look at this and think about what would you do? The truth is that adults very often tell young people to stay safe online and behave in certain ways and then we don't do it ourselves. So things like this are a very useful way of engaging and as I say using the language um, but also giving the message um, around safer, uh, being safe online as well. Help your students understand these questions. Why does someone want me to see this? Why does someone want me to send this? Why does someone want me to believe this? Why does someone want my personal information? So what can we do to protect ourselves as teachers? This is as important as, um, as safeguarding our students because safeguarding is about everyone. We want to ensure that our students are safe, but we also need to protect ourselves from inadvertently putting ourselves at risk by doing things like breaking our code of conduct um, or anything that might lead to a student, uh, you know, being put at risk in some way. Thinking about how you communicate with students, how you present yourself um, to students, that professionalism that we, we maintain at all times and those boundaries around the staff student relationship. This is partly achieved by things like where you deliver your lessons. So if you're not working from your school or your centre and you're working from home, think about where you work. Have a neutral background. If you can't blur the back of your screen or you don't have a, a, a sign from your centre to put behind you, have a blank wall. Remove photo, photographs, remove pictures, anything that might encourage students to ask and try and engage you into personal questions. Remember the boundaries. I'd also make sure that you know about your technology and you understand how it works. Do you know how to use it properly? Have you been trained? Are you sure you know how to remove a student if necessary? Um, it's really important that we stay up to date with technology and we research current trends and keep yourself safe always, but also keep your student safe always. Strong passwords, as I mentioned earlier, um, keeping images secure. If you are somewhere 
where other people might have access to your laptop or PC, log out when you leave it. If you've got personal details for your students um, on there, access to your students um, from, from that site. So always log out. And think about your professional reputation. Who sees what you put, you put online? Have you got your privacy settings set? Google yourself. Think about what you post. Choose your profile pictures wisely. If we don't, that's when things might go wrong, whether inadvertently or deliberately. So if we lose our professional standards, it can make us vulnerable. So things like don't contact students outside of, of lesson times. If there's a need to do so, do it through official channels. If your students try and contact you, then if they're not using official channels, if they try and approach you through social media, stop, don't engage and tell someone. So I just want to ask you now, just for a moment, to do another poll for me, just to see an idea of whether people in the room have had safeguarding or welfare concerns and if you knew what to do. So Nathan, is it possible to open that poll? Thank you. I'll just give you a moment to do that. So the vast majority at the moment are coming in with they didn't know what to do. Or weren't sure what to do, perhaps. Yeah, the majority seems to be more, more not knowing than knowing. I'm going to let that um, I, I, Nathan, I don't know if it's possible to let that run, but I'm going to to keep going with the slides um, uh, as well while while that goes. I think, um, and hopefully, uh, the next couple of slides will will give you a couple of ideas to help with that as well um, as we go. Yeah, the it's uh, still still running. Uh, it's nearly okay. finished. Um, I'll have to close the poll afterwards when it's finished. So you, to come back to the slides. That's fine. No, that's no problem at all. OK, so we, we, we're nearly there. Yeah. No, it's, it's fine. Leave it open. Running. The slides and the poll are different things. You can keep going, Barbara. Yeah, OK. All right. I, I mean, I've got an idea that it's more no than yes. That's kind of where I'm, I'm going for. Um, so what do we do if we have a concern? Well, Firstly, just a reminder of what those triggers or signs, those jigsaw pieces might be. It could be absences, changes in behaviour, changes to interest or level of work. Um, it could be outward signs. Don't miss the obvious. You know, if somebody is looking neglected, if they're visibly upset, if they're more withdrawn, all of those things are signs that you should notice. With concerns that you have, transparency is key it's very very important if you have a concern log everything what when how with whom anything that you've noticed anything that went wrong and put that in your report know who to report to so if you work for some a center or school know who it is that you can report to and if you need to make a report how do you do that is there a specific form do you send an email? Do you call them? And when is that person available? Is there someone available 24 seven or only specific times? If you don't have someone to report to in your center or you perhaps you work independently, think about who needs to know, who can assist you, um, local resources, support services, online support services, children's services, the police, um, if someone discloses to you, you need to know about these different resources that might be available to you. It's also important that when you write things down, you don't embellish. You write exactly what you've been told. Don't correct. Don't correct the English. Don't correct the language. Um, because if this does go further, it's important that accuracy 
um, is, is maintained. Key is don't promise confidentiality. Secrets are not a good thing. Now, I'm not saying tell everybody. That's not what it means when there's no confidentiality. What it means is you only tell those who need to know. Don't promise someone that you won't tell anyone. Remember that safeguarding is everybody's responsibility. So if you don't feel able to deal with it, tell someone else who you think will be able to act on your behalf. Some things are tricky to deal with and there's nothing wrong in asking for help. Equally, if you think that you've passed it on and nothing's being followed up, then report that because it's important that things are taken seriously. The other thing that's open to us, um, as well as obviously in our lessons, is to perhaps do welfare checks. Now, regular uh, welfare checks are, are helpful, um, particularly if they've been timetabled at the beginning, they're scheduled in as part of um, the whole process. Um, when they're not scheduled in and they just get added on, sometimes that raises concerns in family homes as to why that's happening and you might get more resistance. But if you do do a welfare check, that's your opportunity to ask how the student's coping with online learning and is there any difficulties they're having in, in learning in that way and, and are they okay with their classmates? Remember, this isn't an academic chat, it's much more about how they are, they're, they're um, managing themselves. And remember, it's as important to watch how a student responds as much as what they're saying. So um, watch body language too. An alternative might be to send out a very short questionnaire with an open question to ask the students how they're getting on and how they're feeling. There are lots of resources out there um, for you. Um, to use and to look at. Here are some examples of things that we, uh, websites that we have available to us in the UK, and some of these may well be available to you um, in your country. Um, there are lots of good resources. Find them before you need them. Um, good luck with your lessons. And remember that lessons uh, can be creative and diverse as your imagination allows them to be. Just check in when you plan and ask yourself that question, is there a potential risk here? Can I adapt this slightly to remove that risk? Thank you. Um, we've got a little bit of time now. I was gonna have a, Nathan, I, I don't know where we are with questions, if there are questions in there or. Yeah, we have a, a few questions. There's some absolutely fantastic engagement. Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of concerns uh, with this, and I think you've highlighted um, quite a few points. Um, I just bring up some of the questions that I've um, I've copied and pasted uh, from the the, the Q and A. Um, one question, quite interesting. I would like to ask: What else can we include in our online lessons, except digital handouts, YouTube videos, online games, and Word documents? I mean, the content of the lessons, all of those things you can use. Um, I know that the next session, I think, is looking at, at um, digital learning. So I'm sure that you'll get lots of ideas from that um, as well. I don't think there's any limit on anything that anyone uses. Just think about how it's being used and if there are any potential risks around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, it's, 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 it's infinite, isn't it? Yeah. And it's got constantly evolving as well. Another question, yeah. obviously, to do with safety. Uh, how can we convince parents to watch over the children during the online learning? Many parents think that their children are safe as long as they're holding the device with the teacher delivering the lesson. What can we do in this case? So, you know, this is a, it's quite an open-ended question, but uh, it, it sort of follows the general feeling, you know, of, of um, the feeling of being safe online and mm -hmm. uh, the... i think i think that using something like the student code of conduct and getting that sent out prior to the students starting lessons with you and getting the, the parents to acknowledge that um uh the code of conduct and if you as a center i mean not a lot of centers don't are happy for the parents not to be there um, and because, you know, the teacher manages manages the session without the parents there or what they do is they ask the parents to pop in occasionally, mm. make that part of 
of the guidance that you send to the parents at the very beginning before the lesson starts so that they have clear idea of what's expected of them and then if it's not happening you've got something that you can go back to to say to the parents look this is something you had you acknowledged um you you acknowledge receipt of and this is this is our terms for doing these lessons don't be afraid to kind of go back to that um to ensure that that's happening great great another little question as well uh, made reference to during your uh, presentation uh, the suggestion to keep the video on all the time um, mm -hmm. that makes some learners uncomfortable at times they may not want to show you know the place where they are and so forth um, basically what what's your recommendation on this and why I know it's quite challenging and I know that there are different views on this um, I know that some mainstream schools don't have videos on at all um, my personal view as I say is to have the videos on because and explain to students why, um, partly because there have been cert certain situations and circumstances where someone else has then joined the class and it's then very difficult for the, the um, teacher to know who they're working with. It also makes communication between students much harder when you can't see people's faces. Um, but I understand that sometimes, you know, that might not be possible. Technology lets us down and you can't always see people um maybe you can ask for videos to be switched on right at the very beginning and right at the very end and at, at certain periods randomly through the lesson just so that you're checking in with who you have in the room yeah, yeah great great uh, another question what do you think is the most important thing to make uh, teacher students relationship being trust to each other or having a sort of element of trust with each other online learning is it emotional values in are emotional values important? I think it's exactly the same as face to face. I don't think there's any different. It's set, it's creating um, a, um, rapport between you and your students in the same way as you would with face to face. Um, you know, asking, having those open, sort of more free flowing conversation times when you can have more free flowing conversations, um, getting to know your students. You can let them get to know you, but remember it's on a professional basis. You're not telling them your personal stories. Um, it's it's building that rapport from, from that side. So it's no different to, to as you would in a face-to-face -face environment. Great, 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 Barbara. Another, another question here, should teachers separate their online teaching identities from their personal teaching identities? Hmm, quite an interesting question here. Yeah, I would say, you know, anything you can do um, to do that, yes, why not? But little caveat there, um, people are great at finding other people online. Um, I, I'm not using the word, not, it's not stalking so much, but it's tracking down, if you like. Hmm. Um, so even if you have a, a, an online um, identity for your work, um, if you have other present, if you have presence on other social media platforms, your students will find you. Um, so make sure that those are are also set with privacy settings. Be careful what you post on those because they won't always um, just stick with the, your professional identity. They'll they'll look for you if they want to, as they will with their their other students. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, as you well uh, well brought out. Uh, students uh, are pretty techy, they're very good, and uh, they often put us to shame as all the parents uh, yeah. for the way they can find things. Great. Um, another um, uh, question, um, quite an interesting question here. What if it, uh, somebody's in a country where there's, you know, none of these apply, these uh, sort of rules, who can help to support them? So if they don't have that sort of a, uh, structure there, the, the guidance, um, where can they look on an international level? Uh, for guidance to, to, to the way to behave online with the students? There are a number of international websites um, or websites that now deal internationally and globally. If, for example, I've got one on screen that's Global Kids Online. Um, so there are organisations that are very aware that, the, as I, I mentioned in the, in the presentation, you know, the internet has no borders. So mm. a lot of these sites, as long as you can access them um, uh, from where you are, you will get guidance and information um, uh, from those websites and they can 
point you in the right direction for things that you might be able to do in wherever your home country may be. So, yes. so do explore. Yeah, great, great. Um, an interesting question here, a little bit more specific. Uh, what do you do in case of bullying? Unfortunately, a, a problem that does exist all over the world. It is hard to catch the bully if it's on a social media group. Um, are there any tips there? Any um, sort of things that you, you could sort of advise with regard to this? Yeah, sure. Well, um, one of the things particularly uh, that we, we are moving towards within, particularly in the UK um, with safeguarding is that uh, we're moving away from that reliance on hearing something firsthand that we we can also take action if from overheard conversations from reported conversations so you don't necessarily need to catch someone doing it to start that conversation i think having very clear bullying procedures in your organization is really important um, and a zero tolerance approach to it so the message is consistent um, remember, with safeguarding, we're safeguarding everyone. So not only are we safeguarding the potential, I don't like to use the word victim, but the victim of the, the bully, we also need to safeguard the bully, what's going on for them that they are doing this in the first place. So having that conversation with both parties is very important with this and, and being very clear, as I say, with your procedures um, and acting upon it. You, the world with online and offline is, is merged Interestingly, when, when we had lockdown in the UK, the online bullying reduced, um, and which was surprised everyone because everyone was locked down and in their homes. Everyone thought that bullying would increase online. But in actual fact, it, it, it reduced and then it only increased when everything opened up. And there seems to be an element of face-to-face of -face and online. Um, and I think that, that that's really important to take on board, that we're ha things are happening in the real world and offline and online as well. So um, it all crosses over. So it's important yeah. even if you overhear it. Yeah, no, it's, it's good to hear that. Um, absolutely. Um, it, it's been fascinating to, to listen to you, Barbara. Um, it's some really, really valid points wherever we live in the world because, uh, you know, it, 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 this, this uh, online... And working online is uh, is so good it, it can help students to learn but at the same time there are things that we have to be careful of but if, we, if we're mindful of this uh, we can be successful in teaching english online it's been absolutely great to have you with us barbara um it's an absolute pleasure i'm going to bring myself back on um and uh, we'd like to thank barbara very much and we really appreciate the excellent presentation coherent very clear